Welcome everyone. This is the November 8th Open ZFS production users call. We have Alexander, Steve, Jason, and myself, Michael, so far. And it looks like there is news to share. It looks like RAID Z expansion landed today, but it could be quite some time till it hits a stable release. The Open ZFS Developer Summit videos are up. Sorry for any delay on those. The audio is a bit dicey. And uh and the FreeBSD Vendor Summit took place Thursday and Friday of last week and was really good. I suggest you watch the talks. They're short and sweet, but they're just passionate and awesome. So uh, let's see. Alexander, any comments for all of us as users on those releases, be it Raid Z expansion? It's been six oh. years in the making. I have a kid that is older. <laughs> it's like younger than that, actually. So go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, it was a pretty long project, but thanks uh, everybody who participated, Don Brady, who finally done last step, and uh, Matt Aarons, who, who was doing earlier steps, and IX Systems, and other who sponsored it. Uh, FPZ Foundation also was, don't remember who else, but I guess it could be more. But finally, it's landed. Uh, according to Brian Bechlindorf, it will stay in master for now, uh, and should be in OpenZFS 2.3 which unfortunately will be still be in a year. Like Cadence was one release a year, but Science 2.2 was delayed for like nine months. I was hoping maybe we'll get to have 2.3, not in a year, but in like four months, five. But he written in a year. So I guess that's when 2.3 will be at, at the end, unless anything happen again. Uh, release... Uh, 2.2.1 uh, should be cooked in soon. Uh, patches are being already collected by uh, Tom Brady, I think. Uh, so PR is already open and been tested. Um, there was out of important things that, that actually triggered it was issue found in block cloning uh, that allowed block cloning between the encrypted and non-encrypted data set with predictable data, data corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's that was a trigger, but there are also a lot of smaller changes which are still like uh, good to have. So hopefully we'll have two to one release uh, in the nearest week or two. I don't know when, but it's already been collected and tested. So hopefully it should be released soon. Um, into freebies. Into freebies is also a nice feature to have. But go ahead. <laughs> No, yeah, it's uh, the expansion is good to have, but that, as I told, will be master or in time 2.3. It's definitely yeah. not yes, candidate definitely. for cool. 211. Out of uh, our team patches, we have uh, several coming. Uh, just yesterday was uh, landed a patch by Ed Nadolsky uh, that improves multiple. Uh, like multi-threaded sync process, which allows to write multiple Z walls same time, which should allow to overcome limit of quarter million blocks per second that existed in ZFS forever. Of course, uh, that's of course, if nothing else, bottlenecks you. It's for many systems, that's not a primary bottleneck, but I hit it for years and very happy that it finally got fixed and blended. So Ed was working on it science June or about so it took a while but it got implemented landed excellent uh, and others are some minor things there uh we're still investigating what bad can happen uh to Linux if ZFS uses their more than half of RAM uh we're investigating with at that area uh from one side, nobody screaming and uh, screaming loudly about it, and that's why in ZFS master uh, now limit of fifty percent is removed, just to collect information. But just uh, looking myself on that code in SPL wrapper in ZFS around allocation code, I see some more reasons why it was originally introduced. It's not a big factor now. Science ABG scatter arc support. Uh, but before that implementation, I'm surprised ZFS was working at all. <laughs> so bad it is. So at least there is a, like as I've told, it's not a primary factor now, but still there is a space for improvement. 
So Ed will likely work on that. Also some interest to, on working on faster arc reclamation. That's another point in ZFS that limits performance to about a third of a million blocks per second. That with a parallel sync fixed, uh, that's probably another bottleneck that Ed is also going to look on that. So there are always interest, a lot of interesting things. But that's perspective. Excellent. And just the sheer refinement is wonderful. Um, one topic that keeps coming up is clever uses for block cloning. I'm curious if anyone has since the last few calls come up with any, because it's such a powerful tool that I don't think we've even imagined what can be done with it. Uh, um when I saw some of this uh, corruption issues come up with encrypted data sets and block cloning, I started getting quite concerned because I use a fair bit of encrypted data sets and I'm going, I hope this is not on by default or any new rights that are being written out, especially with, uh, you know, I've been testing the 14, 14 tree um, prior to release. And um, yeah, I was a bit concerned when I saw that. Does anybody have any input into that or if it's the default or if it's um, you actually have to manually turn it on? In FreeBSD master and in ZFS 2.2 uh, upstream, it's enabled by default. Uh, in FreeBSD 14, it's I think it by default disabled. I don't think it was re-enabled. It's tunable. In 15, it was uh, re-enabled, but in, in 14, I think it's... I. I haven't checked, but I think no, previously it was disabled. Yes, for safety purposes. That sounds um, right. Welcome, Jan. Sorry for just jumping in. Regarding safety, uh, I've noticed uh, by looking at FreeBSD 14, including OpenCFS 2.2 with uh, block cloning, that uh, while it's safety gated behind the SysCTL, once enabled, the copy file range system call implicitly does block copying. There's no way to tell it not to do that as far as I can tell. So you can okay. end up with cat or uh, CP accidentally starting to deduplicate things, uh, even when you know that you uh, uh, will overwrite them immediately and there isn't anything to be gained from going through additional levels of interaction. Like uh, uh, in, in, in 14 branch, if block cloning is disabled, then copy file range will literally copy file range. It will not clone. But, uh, if you, there's one sysctl apparently to just enable it, and then yeah. uh, copy file range with it between file systems on the same pool, uh, just block copying instead of no, uh, if block cloning is disabled, copy file range will read and write. It will be full copy. Yes, so if it's disabled, be... but once you want to make use of it for some things, you're no longer in control of what copy file range does. There's no way to do it basically per syscall. And why would you want it? Uh, they know that uh, the, basically the deduplication will be immediately destroyed because, let's say, I basically... I take a copy and then do some kind of in-place mutation immediately or something. Uh, it's I, I agree that it's mostly what you want, but one reason why I can see where you would kind of want to have it is if you know that some process later down the line will uh, break the deduplication and you want to take the storage cost immediately instead of only on backup restoration or something. If you have a backup mechanism, which doesn't preserve this information. But for some temporary objects, you may still work. It's a bit contrived, but I've just noticed that it looks like there's no way to control it per syscall. There's indeed no way to control it on FreeBSD. On Linux, uh, there are separate calls. One yeah. is called copy. No, the copy file range works the same. It, it's the uh, same as on FreeBSD. It always mm -hmm. copy, you know, like it always uses clone if it can. But in addition to copy file range, there are options in CP. You can either copy explicitly, or you may, may tell either clone or fail. There are calls oh, like that. Remember like, correctly, Linux has one which works on full 
for all the scriptors, not ranges or something, or even takes a yeah. path. And that one takes a flag if you wanted to do block cloning or not. Well, yeah, but uh, for example, uh, both Linux SM SMB and NFS servers, they use copy file range and they mm -hmm. all, always use cloning. I, on, it's like comments like CP has that argument uh, whether you want to do it optionally, not do it at, at all. But as my personal taste, it adds complication to places where it shouldn't be. Yep. Like, I agree that in 95 or more percent of the time, you just want to use the default and you want it to work well. It's just that I've been bitten in the past by the basically the ever growing depth of the old style of ZFS uh, online deduplication. I've tried it once, it has bitten me, so I'm a bit afraid of it basically being the default and I would like to opt in per whatever to it to slowly understand how much overhead over time builds up with this instead of finding out that I'm using it everywhere and there's no way back uh, without a full pool recreation. And it sounds like you're fine. I just see that I've been run in default, the past correct? and uh, a bit... Um, no, actually, you should, if you delete all the the duplicate, all the cloned data, you should return back to original. Like, if the table is empty, it can be disabled. But as a question, oh, do so you really want it? There's really a way back to a pool, so that the older version of ZFS can use the pool again. If you really find all files and rewrite them. No, well, for for most of ZFS features, no, not for most, but for many, they are literally counter of blocks that are affected by feature. Once you delete all the blocks, you can disable feature. Okay. So it should be same here. I don't know what's what practical chance to make sure that everything yeah. deleted or overwritten. Uh, but generally, yeah, it's possible. I mean, it should be possible. Now it's too late, but uh, and it isn't an urgent problem because it's basically uh, off by default. But a compromise I could see to make even more users happy would be to just uh, make it a, a file system property if the file system opts into a block level cloning or not. We, I don't think it should be a set. problem. It, but it, it should, it should if it be works proper. well yeah. enough, I would like to have it everywhere. It's just that uh, I've been burned by deduplication once and now I'm a bit overly cautious. Fair enough. Maybe. So no, like, I, I think by the time we get to the point where we add all the tunables, I it hopefully will stabilize enough to make everybody happy. So, yeah. Would we do it if, from the beginning? It would have more sense. But if now the table think... is so small that it doesn't create a memory hawk which turns into a performance uh, bottleneck, then I would like to see it available by default so that you can just rely on it being there without requiring any special permissions of course. by the super user to allow you to make use of it. The so. table is dramatically smaller than the dupe. And uh, over here, it's dramatically smaller. Sure, there are some, but again, the, the more you use, the more over here. Plus, unlike of yeah. the dupe, it's, uh, it, it uses uh, offset-based Table not uh, hash based, it, so updates are very local. If you copy, it, if you clone this particular mm -hmm. 100 megabytes, it will be in this particular part of uh, clone table. So it's very localized, it's much lower over here. I've seen the slides on it, but didn't read the code. So that makes a lot of sense why it's so much smaller. Uh, Mav, will that be eventually data? That specific, you can turn it on and off per data set. It wasn't planned. I, I just okay. personally thought well, it could be done, but again, I, as I've told, by the time it. It, it can be implemented, it may not have a sense. Got it. But... If it doesn't have any uh, growing uh, problems with low memory, large disk systems. I'm completely happy to see it work by default, but it's just that I have... Uh, You're scarred from deduplication. Yes. I get it. I get it. Understood. 
Anything yeah, else I think, on, go I ahead, think it should be trivial to, to make it property just. Okay. I don't, I don't see a point. The point would really? be the paying storage and bandwidth cost ahead of time once instead of um, setting yourself up for a point where you, you're used to uh, a better SLA than you can guarantee. Yep. That's... Well, the problem is if you have a neat optimization like deduplication, which works most of the time, at some point, even if it's not the level of service you guarantee, you, your users will have an expectation of this level of performance and this level of yep. accountings and stuff. And the other problem, where I, which is not com as contrived as the other ones I can see, is to uh, have a problem where um, you want to make sure that you can actually, let's say, restore this file system on this me uh, pool from a tarball or something, the file system content, uh, because you can't recreate the deduplication if you're just untied. No, I don't have solution for per data set uh, statistics, but uh, if we, you talk about per pool, there are statistics of how many blocks are yeah, the, per pool uh, I've are found and in how much the pool get. Well, well, yeah, I, it's just if somebody wants, they could be exposed explicitly. Uh, like it's, it's this much data, it's taken space. It's taken it takes now versus X amount of space could, can be used if we are decloning. Michael, I can answer the question you just wrote on untowering a tarball of uh, deduplicated files. You will not recreate the deduplication. Oh, fair enough. That's like I'd say predictable so causes behavior. That you take, so yeah, let's say a big jail with lots of files in it. Tar it, and you can't re restore the tar. Yeah, because it doesn't fit anymore. Oh well, there's that. Yes, yes. Well, keep track of your POSIX counters. I hope it gives you an accurate. You know, if I were to copy this all to NTFS, how big it is. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But it's good to know about. Yep. OK, uh, Mav, are there benefits on Zvols? Do you think block cloning it's, has some internal it, benefit to, like, say, um, VMs and friends? Oh, yes. It, it would be great things to have it for things like uh, VMware uh, to do some vMotion, uh, VM cloning, and so on. It would be dramatic. The problem is to pass it through block layer on FreeBSD, Linux, or wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's missing part. Obviously, um, we want it. It just finish. needs to be done. Isn't there a SCSI command to do block range copies through CTL? In SCSI, there is a, uh, there are two implementation of a copy of load. One is uh, traditional SCSI uh, called extended copy or X copy. Another uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. one creates, uh, how is that called? I forgot it was a while. Uh, create token right from token. But idea is the same. You create token from a range of blocks on the a, on a disk and mm -hmm. then tells the right copy over there. Because that would be a way to exit it through, access it through VitIO SCSI inside a Beehive cast and FreeBSD, for example, and then use it through CTL to quickly move, let's say, or just copy a big virtual machine, take a snapshot, and then get basically a rebasable clone of a Z wall. No, I don't know about Beehive, but in case of VMware, if you use vMotion in VMware, it uh, mm -hmm. tries to use extended copy by default. And if it fails, it does copy by itself. So if storage support extended copy, it does it offloads. Right now, if you use C uh, CTL as storage, CTL will practically do a read and write locally without drives to transfer mm -hmm. through iSCSI, through network. Okay. But next top step, obviously, would be uh, if it just call uh, copy file range instead. Uh, no, copy like, file like, uh, well, equivalent of copy file range, whatever, as a primitive implemented. And then it would just happen immediately. Instead of actually reading and writing, it would create a copy of VM almost instantly. 
Is there a reason why copy file range can't be used on a character device file descriptors? Just that it's... Or... No, it's just uh, there is no such uh, method exists in CDEV oh, for so there is character no... device. Yeah, so the function table doesn't have an entry for it. Okay, so yeah, no, I I have feeling that Linux have a lot of weird methods for that for random things. They do reservation on character device. They do who knows what. I wouldn't be totally surprised that would Linux have some sort of copy. I don't know. Yeah, but FreeBSD definitely doesn't. So it needs some research. Yeah. Any other topics on block cloning? This I is want it for block devices. Uh, it sounds yeah. really useful because it basically lets us sidestep the problem of um, inheritance between clone and uh, snapshot by basically making the blocks full base. The downside is that you have to do it explicitly through proper tooling, uh, maybe through an offline scanner, which could scan the blocks and do an offline deduplication to basically punch deduplicated blocks into existing devices, uh, which would basically make it a user space daemon which holds the big slow ddub table to build up and could use like the information available in incremental sense to find out which blocks changed and then only ddub those so that you can basically I have okay I'm I deduplicated up to this snapshot now let's deduplicate the other ones and then you could potentially have a background deduplicator in user space, which doesn't require the painful um, existing dedup. Cool. Of course, that would be a problem if anyone else concurrently writes to that yeah. device, because uh, yeah, that of course would be racing that. So well, it would have to be the sole writer for this time. Keep brainstorming. But, I love your ideas because you go into territory a lot of us do not go to. No, thinking, thinking about dedup and how good or bad it is, uh, there is ongoing work right now, uh, co-sponsored by IX Systems also and done by Clara. Uh, and uh, to practically rewrite dedup in half uh, and new implementation should be dramatically cheaper. Of course, not as cheap as block cloning, but times cheaper. So uh, they already very close to that there was pre there was presentation on yeah the, you have a perfect segue the videos are uh, compare and swap and uh, version talk. of file copy range uh, it could be used to uh, do this basically you would give the uh, block layer the old content and the reference to where to deduplicate it to and it would only deduplicate if that's still the content that it would basically do within an atomic operation, compare the current content of this block against the content which it's supposed to, and basically, or basically a try dedupe would also be that you just tell it, yeah, this block can also be found here. Please change this reference. This is the kind of operation you would have to have. Uh, and then the kernel could even do it because in the successful case, the blocks are identical. The one that's the well-known block, yeah, but cool. it should just work. Yeah. If you know that blocks are identical, you can just you you can just call copy file range on them. Yeah, uh, but the problem is if you do that from user space uh, and there are concurrent modification to the file uh, to the block. No. Or yeah, yeah. That's true. Problem, I, I, I agree with that. Telling the kernel, and the offline. Here are two blocks which are supposed to be identical. Dedupe them if they are. The kernel could do it under a lock to then only lock only the uh, intervals you want to modify to dedupe for the duration of the operation. 
or indicate uh, I, I prevented a race condition, please try again. He again well, yes, uh, it's sli slightly similar to that. Uh, for a while, people wanted to be able to touch every blocks of a file, for example, to balance data between VDFs or uh, to like to deduplicate or who knows what else. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it would be good to just tell, rewrite this block as it is <laughs> on kernel level. Yep. So that, that, that would, that would be, be nice. That would be a good way. That Especially if a... you could combine it with a basically the normal rebalancing logic intensify it. Because if I understand the tokens on correctly, what ZFS does as of OpenZFS 2. something is that basically you have a rock stealing queue of writes and the fastest uh, um, active slabs just take the most work. And the idea is that empty uh, slabs, so allocation areas are just uh, faster to use, so they will take up more of the writes. And yeah, if you combine this with the rewrite in place with rewrite to, re to reverse the most space instead of the highest throughput, oh. that would oh, yeah. uh, make it that, possible. That's enough. To that's so another topic I'd like from... to look myself. Yeah, I got what you're talking about. That's another thing I would like to look myself for actually a few years, unless somebody else dive into it. Uh, if we have, uh, right, right now, we practically have two different mechanisms in ZFS. From one side, there is a code that under small load should try to uh, distribute data proportionally to capacity, but under heavy load, it distributes proportionally to write speed. But it would be good that it would change the it would change the logic under uh, like if we get capacity close to X or something like that, just adjust mm -hmm. Q, Q lens dynamically so that we would balance not only by right speed but also by capacity. Okay, so you can sure, like that proportionally gets us into choose things one, like right? making the Q numa aware so you have a Q per a numa domain and stuff like this, but. How is that related to new? I was talking about VDFs, VDF um, space. Yes, and for performance on uh, NVMe systems, so that basically you prefer to keep to your locally attached uh, storage devices within your domain and not try to take buffers from other domains unless you with have to. With ZFS copying data several times in memory, that's the last it's, thing. That's, yeah, is uh, yeah, yeah. no, no copying them through potentially congested uh, buses between NUMA domains. Mm. Well, yeah, that, that, that's true. But again, uh, if you want to avoid memory copies, you should start from that. Uh, you should yeah. st start the like direct IO patch already in work for a while in ZFS. Those allow you can bypass most of uh, memory copy operation. You practically should be able to issue uh, write to disk directly from your user space buffers and read same way, unless you use some RAID Z or something, some complicated or use compression, yeah. then it's hopeless. But now, if you don't uh, look... Reason why it would be a very welcome to have this deadly, just rewrite this block in place in the current pool configuration would be to uh, Restripe uh, expanded rate Zs because, uh, as I understand, if you grow a rate Z uh, VDEF right now, uh, the existing data is, keeps the old data to parity ratio. And if you were to basically do a rewrite in place with the same data, so to get around the changing block pointers problem, mm. uh, you would get the new data written with the new improve data to parity ratio. So if you go from a four disk grade Z2, where you have half data, half parity, to a six disk one, you could yeah, then go to a, from a 50-50 to a 63, uh, 63 to a 33 ratio of data to parity. Right. Which would make the new capacity. Uh, we're getting a little deep into architecture here. <laughs> 
So that's yeah, that's yeah, all yeah. all true un, unless uh, there are snapshots on a data set, then you're doomed. Of course, uh, if you keep old snapshots, then you just uh, blown through basically your whole pool capacity, unless you. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah. Okay. Brilliant, uh, and getting a bit into architecture. And we have not heard from Stu, who has just arrived. I'm curious if you have any topics or questions regarding, say, RAIDSY expansion. Putting uh, you on the spot. I just saw that note on what happens if it uses more than half the memory. What, in context of that, is that during the expansion or is that overall? On Linux specifically? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Mav, what have you seen in practice? Half of memory is not related to expansion. It was dramatically bad problem before ARC got support for ABD, it was cut ABD a number of years ago. Then I'm surprised the FS worked at all because uh, amount of free RAM would be non-existent, close, close to non-existent ZFS. Like you would, would have to drop most of ARC to be able to free anything at all. So uh, these days it should be dramatically better, but still uh, probably not perfect. I mean, we, not... we normally run at 80% ZFS memory. That's how. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. So... Uh, like ARC, it's, ARC itself should be acceptably good. It's more about right now, uh, problem still should remain with transit allocations, like amount of dirty data you have at the time mix of small and large blocks in there also shouldn't help so right i i was just looking for context on that note from earlier so that was because i met because i was unfortunately held up with another meeting so all good mm -hmm. but yeah we, we are continuing looking into that uh we're investigating several sides of that uh, i just looked myself at it a bit uh, last several days at uh, looking on that for a longer time so right now in the zfs master uh, the limit is increased just to collect information if anybody find anything else but there are a few things that could be improved Steve, anything? Uh, just listening this time oh. around. And Jason, beloved host of BSD Now. Uh, anything else in production? It sounds like you're automating OpenBSD installs. And I, has your architecture changed much since you first presented it to the world? Um. So this is totally not CFS related. Um, so we don't need to run Windows site servers anymore. So we've been able to um, simplify uh, the the architecture. So we've been able to remove the uh, FreeBSD and Beehive out of it. We still use FreeBSD and Beehive. Um, don't get me wrong, <laughs> they've got their own places with inside our data centers. Uh, but we know that we need to do them at sites. And we're looking at ways of reducing cost and having more, um, what would you say, consumable devices that can be just nuke and paved out on site. So they were like, instead of putting a $3,000 machine out there, we can put a $500 machine out there and then just have, you know, plenty of stock on hand and with zero touch installs, it allows us to just like pave a new machine and send, send it with the service desk and send it out. So interesting. Um, yeah, so we, we're doing that with zero touch installs on OpenBSD um, with um, Ansible backend. So it enables us to be able to um, tick off the essential eight that we have here of automation of network configuration. Um, so yeah, we can basically, you know, have a automated task each night, just push the configurations back out. So then that way, if there's been any changes by whatever, um, uh, it can be just pushed straight across the top of the fleet and nobody's in, any the wiser. Are May you I pushing ask... that or are you using Ansible poll to get that effect? Um, 
just just basic Ansible. I'm not using anything complex in that. Um, uh, what we do is we have a central configuration file, and OpenBSD has in basically all their daemons an include feature. So mm -hmm. we have a standard uh, uh, like OSPF and BGP configuration files that get pushed out to uh, each machine. And then um, there's a unique conf.local file and uh, that's that's pushed out to each machine. And then basically the variables within that are brought into either OSPF or BGP or whatever. Um, the whole file gets read in and only the, the um, macros that are required get used and implemented. Cool. Um, cool. And uh, yeah, same with PF and all that sort of stuff. It's all, it's all quite. Uh, we've kept it quite in line with you know how the project has defined their cool. their demons. So um, it's made it quite easy for us to to come up with running configs. Makes us be able to do like you know WebEx might change its IP addresses or whatever, um, and we have an include table for WebEx, and we can just change that WebEx type. Cool. Um, I'll push it out and then reload PF and where it goes. Uh, especially in uh, multi administrator environments where someone may not follow the process all the time and so on. I found that just having Ansible Paul under either a Quan or some other kind of job scheduler, especially one where you can push it if you have to, uh, is very useful because it can just take a Git repository if it changed, reapply it. If you do it manually, reapply it. So that way yeah, you can make sure that even if the system is down while you're pushing, it still will pull on its own. And yeah, that's periodically make that's sure. That's how we've that done it. We, we put the changes are undone. We put the configuration in um, in Git, so all the configuration is that also tracked from an audit perspective as well. So uh, it's basically pushed and uh, pulled down from Git and then pushed from a central machine to the host. There's no pulling occurring. We assume that the, the devices are hostile. Um, they may have whatever, even though they shouldn't. Um, and it's basically a push completely over the top of those. So they're, they're totally, um, uh, you know, ephemeral from our point of view. Cool. Borderline off topic, my bad. Uh, but all valid and maybe a an automation call is due, especially some from some scarring things I've done with Windows Server auto deployments this last 72 hours. Um, I am trying to get to a conference next year at some point. I'm trying cool, to roll yeah. this one it is. Um, and I, I do recommend everyone check out Jason's talk about Beehive and Open BSD and Windows in production. I'm surprised think? that you've escaped. A link, let's dig up there a few of them. Let me dig that up. Or Jason, unless you have a favorite of the few. Um, no, I think Asia BSDCom was probably the most, Is it, it is the most recent one, should I say. Okay. Um, the other um, ones in BSD can 2017, they they got recorded, but they never got published for some reason. I think there was issues with the recordings anyway. So I see. But the Asia BSDCom ones were, um, it were pretty concise and they were built on top of the 17 talk. The Beehive con one comes up from 2019 is that valid that's the one yep okay great i'll punch uh, punch it in there um how did you escape windows if i may just not to totally change the topic but are you like just cloud-based supply level control no um so what was happening was our remote sites were um i suppose a bit more bandwidth constrained at the time um which is not the case anymore um, so we've centralized the print spoolers instead of being out on each site there now it's in the data center as well as um, the distribution points for SCCM uh, in Windows. So um, there's sufficient space there and we're looking at putting um, an external SCCM repository. Um, so then that way, because we use a, a split, hori split horizon, basically VPN um, forming sec tunnel um, back to the data center, but then all web traffic goes out via um, the, the default route out to the internet. So there's plenty of bandwidth on that side of things. So um, uh, our autonomous system has um, a backing onto, you know, 10 gig backing onto um, uh, internet exchange, which our ISP, then we can push back into our ISP that way. So we cool. can push 
pretty heavily at concurrent uh, streams back into um, our ISPs network. Cool. Back to open ZFS. Other topics. <laughs> I've got a hard stop in 20 minutes for what it's worth. Um, other news, questions, ideas, concerns, wish list items. For those who arrived late, I will say the videos from the Developer Summit are up. There's a link in the doc, and the FreeBSD Vendor Summit video should be up next week. They were a lot of fun, very passionate. For the impatient ones, uh, the YouTube live streams are still up, even if they're unlisted. Oh, interesting. Good to know. So okay. you can just throw YouTube uh, DLP on it to okay, get okay. the stream as is. Good eye, good eye. Presumably from their own, like, main page okay uh, cool. i think from the invite from some mail but yes uh, i don't know about the main page okay the Invitation. there was a mail to the uh, announce mailing list i think with the okay. links cool but the uh, the videos are unlisted so you can't search for them got it have you got the links the there link. and get, i mean the minutes here be good What's to be able to just pull the live stream and be able to do with youtube dl and be done with it very cool. One of them should be, let's... Yeah, post that I should that have at least one of them uh, still okay. in my history. Okay. For day two. Um, this is one of them. Which one did you send? Is that... I sent oh, Jason's this... talk from long ago. Uh, okay. Milestone so... talk. It was awesome. It was historic. Um... And I think this video, let's see if the link still works. Here's it is. This The days are out of order. So first day two, then day one. Okay, cool. And you can just use uh, to download them in be the best available resolution. Cool. But they are quite long. So seven yeah, hours imagine. and uh, seven hours again. Same with the open ZFS one but until I ripped them apart. Just fast forward through them. Yep. Lunch break. <laughs> exactly. Just a continuous recording of the live stream. Sometimes they're good. I, I tend to have those up and running because I'm totally whacked on the timeline of factor, um, being able to download them and then just run them while I'm working for the day. And then I'll pick up audio wise on something and then scrub back and, and then listen to it. Yeah. Anything else? Um, yes. Yes. If there's anything that anybody wants to talk about or have announced on BSD Now, please send it through the feedback at bsdnow.tv and uh, we'll include it in the show. So I've already mentioned this uh, last week, but there was, or was nobody here, I think, or was it two weeks ago, um, about a question for feedback on how to uh, basically get m most of the benefits of a dynamic union file system for um, FreeBSD jails or Linux containers without having to go through the pain of suffering of uh, getting any kernel implementation of a union file system uh, production ready or go through a slow uh, fuse user space interaction. Uh, instead, um, what I did is basically I wanted to have read only clones with only modifications for things like creating empty directories for mount points for the FreeBSD user land, a set of packages, and the um, persistent data for the jail. So basically I have two levels of interactions, but the important part to me at least is that I can update the FreeBSD base system independent of the package sets, and I don't have to reapply them like when untarring uh, OCI images. You basically, if something in the lower level of your taskball stack changes, you have to recreate it all. But with this idea, um, I'm 
prototyping here is uh, it's possible to update them without recreating anything in between because I'm never sharing a mount point. The restriction is that you can only have mount points. You can't you build, build a union of populated directories only of an empty mount point and sub mount points. But at least with the FreeBSD file system hierarchy, that's uh, how I, all I found I needed. Uh, and to avoid having to um, migrate uh, slash etc on upgrades, what I'm doing is I basically take a pre-populated yep. tempfs of slash etc every time I started and then apply the changes from gel.conf, which happens in so basically I can uh, provision and start a jail in less than 500 milliseconds on a simple consumer PC. Yeah, so note the October 25th layout that's down in this, scroll down for that. Uh, Dan Langell and had an issue with this, but it was user error over mounting the directory. It uh, was unrelated. So, yep, but he is uh, pushing this notion, beginning to push this notion. And I guess we will keep everyone posted because it's quite promising. It's very native ZFS uh, container storage. So I, I, for one, I'm fascinated. But Jan, let's find out how to really convey this because there's a lot going on and a lot of moving parts. That's <laughs> the problem. That can be overwhelming. Uh, so many things come together. And so before that, what I did is I took the snapshots, cloned them, yep. kept the clones read only so that they, I didn't have to rebase them, which isn't possible. So instead, but for the first part of the problem was that the um, I then created child data sets under them, which made okay. destroying the clones problematic because I had to basically untangle with ZFS rename the inheritance tree to move it away, the whole tree, then recreate the clones and move back the persistent data, which was a mess. Uh, but I found out that I can avoid this by basically having a, a parent with can mount equals off and then have two parents with uh, the same uh, mount point, but both are unmountable. And then the children will derive the right mount points. And by basically keeping the children's can mount property to no auto, they will not be auto mounted out of order. Then the jail startup will list all the data sets sorted by mount point and feed them into ZFS mount one by one. So that uh, even though the data sets aren't related, they can still basically be mounted into each other in the right mount point order so that no yep. hiding under mount points occurs. Jan, I think we need an animation to show exactly what's going on because it's it's brilliant. I'll yeah, grant sure. you that. And then like you have the PAX extraction. So let's let's not uh well, that's just the detail for CTC. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's and, really yeah, impressive. If anyone but can scroll back in the there. minutes and tell me if I'm completely off my rocker. And this is a stupid idea and will explode in my face in the future, or if this can work, I would be very happy about some feedback. That's a good point. So for those who celebrate, it is jail specific, but uh, Jan, do you well, think it would apply to, to say, Docker containers on Linux ZFS? Completely. Uh, if okay. you have the right uh, container runtime to take advantage of that, Okay. anything flexible enough with LXC, you could probably do it out of the box. Okay. Uh, it, the problem is only that the more opinionated ones may not give you the hooks to do this. Yeah. Um, the MFS mounts are just there so that I don't have to do migrations and are basically populated before the jail is started and then uh, kept read only so that they can't uh, acquire um, any state to which gets lost because they are effectively stateless because they're a function of immutable data and the configuration. Okay, if containers interest you, please take a look at the October 25th minutes. They are there, I've highlighted a few things that are exciting, but there's also, I'm sure, some follow-up on the 
last jail call and possibly beehive call because these are so overlapped. Anyway, other uh, topics, just, or shall we call it good? Go ahead. Just one uh, other thing. Um, I don't know. Is, do I have to set NF, NFS for ACLs on ZFS volumes so they've got um, uh, really long file names slash um, uh, directory paths? The reason being is that I had a instance where I had to do a archive for off a Windows server into ZFS uh, for for archive medical archival purposes, but I was hitting issues where um, directory and path names were actually too long. I was getting errors as I was copying it across, um, so I ended up bundling it all into into a um, seven zip archive and just dumping it there. So the archive's there from a uh, records purpose. But um, am I hitting a particular issue because I haven't turned on that value? I can't see how NFS v4 ACLs are re related to paths. If you're allowed to create any path, you're cre allowed to use create all paths for trials within the restrictions of the name element length and the total path length of a ZFS system, which is normally something like 255 bytes and 1,023 bytes. The problem is yeah. that depending on which API you're using on Windows, you have different limitations on the available path lengths, sometimes around 250-ish because you're losing one for the drive letter and so on. So it can easily happen that you have a, an absolute path, which is fine on a Unix-like system, but unaccessible to most Windows uh, applications because uh, you have to use a special Windows long path API to interact with longer paths. And then I think you can have paths up to 64 kilopyte, which wouldn't be supported by Unix systems unless you raise uh, path max to more than one kilobyte or four kilobytes, depending on the platform. And yeah. Does that help? Of course, with relative paths, you can build up even longer crap, but yeah. Yeah, that, that helps. That's given me somewhere to go and have a look at. And you, you mentioned volumes. Uh, volumes, uh, so ZFS volumes don't apply to that. Was it a mistake, or are you using block-level storage exposed to Windows via iSCSI or something like that? No, it was just uh, SMB uh, sand okay. exposed. The other thing is to just go through your SMB conf and expand it again to find out how it combines with your SMBD version's uh, default settings and whatever the distribution may have put in the reference configurations. And yeah, the annoying part is that some things like uh, oblocks uh, interact in complicated ways with other features which are scattered all over the SMBD main page or SMBD conf main page. Uh, so yeah, that can also okay. cause Super. annoying spurious errors. Thank you, Ian. What can Anything help else? is to basically, if you want, if you're only getting close to it and not ridiculously far beyond it is to just register the SMB mount as a drive letter, like make it your Y or Z drive or whatever. And then you don't have the problem that it's under a long prefix. And yeah, you have I, the... I, I did try that. <laughs> Except the first thing is like, oh yeah, I better do that. Uh, and didn't fix it, so. Because I've had that with customers who would complain that they couldn't unpack the zip files they wanted from us following their naming scheme because it works when they do it on their C drive, but if they do it, uh, try to unpack it on their network drives, which aren't registered as drive letters, it's such a long path prefix that they cannot unpack the paths on Windows. And of course, it's always on the sender to prove that, no, my zip file is innocent, it's your stupid uh, setup with a two kilometer long uh, shear name, uh, which causes a problem. Yep. That's why my system is like 
Z slash D slash F for files. <laughs> yep, <laughs> nice and short. Anyway, well, thank you, everyone. Let's call it. I can leave this open for a little bit if you want to chat, and I will perhaps see you next week. All right. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. Thanks, Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys.